Next up, we have Kylie Watson, who's going to talk through the traditional crime versus cybercrime, uh, pulling away the media persona, who is actually attracted to cybercrime. Can you predict who would be the hacker in your high school now? How does it help your defences? Uh, how, how does it help your defence to know what motivates cyber criminals? Um, and as, as normal, I'll, uh, it, I'll uh, have a little bio that I asked ChatGPT to write up for me very nicely before. So Kylie Watson holds the record for the most consecutive sneezes while simultaneously jubbing, juggling five rubber chickens. Her unique talent has earned her the nickname the Sneezy Juggler, and her performances always leave audiences both amazed and reaching for tissues. Can we have a very warm round of applause uh, for Kylie Watson from PwC? Thank you. Thank you for that. I don't think I've ever been introduced along with rubber chickens, so that's um, quite interesting. Um, I don't even think I've ever touched a rubber chicken, actually, or, or we all sneeze. Um, look, I'm here today to talk to you about cyber criminals, traditional crime versus cyber crime, right? So people have been committing crimes for thousands of years. And um, I bet you that every single person in this audience knows somebody that has committed a crime. Whether it was when you're a kid in a lolly shop and they stole a lolly, or maybe it was you, or whether you know someone that's you know, um, had something more heinous that they've done. But we have evidence of policing units. You know, it's been going on forever. People have been doing this forever. We have evidence of policing units from ancient Egypt times through to you know, Aristotle and Plato, Greek, Roman times, trying to work out consequences. You know, what do we do in this traditional crime space? And as someone who's you know, worked at universities before and is also out there in the industry, you know, I really want to go and have a look at you know, what is all the research that's been done out there in the past. And when you have a look at it and you think about it, we've really only got about 50 years of research here on the cybercrime and cybercriminals. And perhaps even less than that, because when I first started looking this up back in 2016, there was hardly anything. And even now, when I go in and I go into Google Scholar and I go into the university research papers and journals, a lot of stuff is um, probably three to four years ago. So we're not finding, as Brian had said, probably enough emphasis or research in this space. So I'm particularly fascinated by it. I work with clients you know, on a daily basis trying to help them profile who's in their systems and, and how we should kick them out um, appropriately. So, I want to flick to, you know, academics love a good definition. Sorry, I'll just check if this is working. What am I supposed to point this to? Because it's not working. But... Sorry, guys, just wait a second. I think it's showing low battery. Um, so. I will keep talking if someone could actually replace the battery or do this remotely for me. Um, haven't had that happen before either. So I'll talk off the cuff until we find this. So basically, I went and did some research and look, who was actually convicted? Like who was being convicted of a cybercrime? And um, I found a guy that you might all be quite aware of, um, Ian Murphy. And there's some controversy over, was he actually convicted of a cybercrime or was it actually a felony instead? Because we really didn't have the legislation. We know that the legislation um, often needs to be able to catch up. Um, he successfully hacked into AT&T's clocks back in the 80s. And what he did was he changed the metering billing rate times so that he would be able to you know, make the calls and other people and friends that he knew were able to make the calls and it would cost them less at certain times. I think it was around midday or something. So if we have a look at that and then we have a look at the nature of the kind of cybercrime that we have now, it is radically different. So although it's been around for about 50, 60 years, those types of crimes are quite different to what we're seeing today in the everyday. Still no. Oh, got it. 
use this one. Okay, cool. Um, and you can see a definition up there. Okay, it differs to traditional crime. There's no physical or geographic boundaries and can be conducted with less effort, greater ease, and a greater speed than traditional crime. Okay. I don't have to tell this audience that it's becoming a bit of a nightmare, okay? We see uh, Minister Claire O'Neill out there. We see the headlines. We're in the security operations centres. We work in this space. It's becoming a nightmare. I always like um, to have a look at some of these cartoons to really get it across. But, you know, it's only emerged recently in human history and we need to know more about it. So again, if I have a look at you know, all these typical slides that you get and you have a look at all the different cuts of um, you know, what's actually occurring out there, everyone has a different cut on what's going on. Ransomware does tend to be at the top and supply chain and obviously social engineering as we heard of this morning. But um, I wanted to emphasise that back in 2016, I came over to cyber. So I'd worked in data and analytics and prior to that I'd been in engineering. And I came over to cyber and I was able to keep across everything. So I could know the major attacks, what was going on, who were the perpetrators, what were the motivations, what was the impact, what was being done about it, right? And I'm sure all of you in the room here probably felt the same. We were across it. If you look today, I come out of a meeting and we'll probably come out of here and there'll be something new in the news. There will be more attacks, more frequently, more often, and we can't keep up. And I'm sure it'd be interesting in the conversations that you have at lunchtime to just go and you know, say, oh, what do you think of the recent X attack? And just see um, you know, how much people actually might know about that one. Don't make them feel bad about it, but I can bet you that you're probably across a whole raft of attacks that are different to what someone else is across. And it could be depending on your industry, but the idea is that it's thicker, faster than ever before. And we have all these cuts about, you know, who are the criminals and how do we classify them? Um, we classify them, but I like to go deeper on motivations. And you can see there that insider threats are across all of these. Later, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the espionage criminal and then hacktivists and sabotage in more detail. But um, what I really wanted to do was draw your attention to there's heaps of theories out there. And I'm not going to bore you with theory. I'm going to try and interest you with some of the theories so you can take it back and apply it. But basically, um, I want to look at who's attracted to cybercrime, the psychology behind those attracted to cybercrime, and the theory. So I've got four theories I'll touch on. A case study, and just try to map that back to some of the profiling and the theories. And then, um, obviously, we're going back to this theme about thinking about, you know, who do you think might have been a hacker back in high school, right? And you think about it. Some of you might even know someone that's been convicted now. But, um, you know, who would that might have been? And then touch on, as Brian had said, why does it matter? And probably have similar themes to Brian, who was in the room before me, talking about serial killers and cyber um, criminals. So have a look at those linkages. So who is attracted to cybercrime? I have been working on a literature review. I've just put in a paper recently to the International Cybersecurity Journal. Some of you might know about that. It's been going for years. Um, and that will come out shortly. Once I did that, I said, oh, there's a big gap here. I actually really want to get into the profiling. Like the profiling is significantly weak. And you think about traditional crime, and we all know about detectives, we all see the TV shows, we all see the profile, and we all hear about the interventions that they try to enact, right, to be able to address the issue or to get better at convicting people once caught. So either early intervention or better at the conviction space. Um, what I've got here today for you is not 100% accurate, it is a living, breathing piece of research. I'm thinking I'll probably put chat GPT onto it. I haven't done it yet. I've actually used real life humans that I have access to in universities and myself to come up with this and go across. We went across 30 different reports um, looking at you know, anything that touched on the profiling and we looked at 20 criminal convictions. So what I've done is aggregated this data to be able to give you some insights and have a bit of fun with this to see you know, what are the actual demographics, who is doing this. There is a scarcity of available data, okay? It is really scarce. And one of my biggest messages is always to encourage people to try and go out there and encourage more to be done in this space. So, if we have a look here, I'll 
move over here. Age. Actually, everyone stand up in the room. Please stand up in the room. I promise you don't have to do anything more than stand up or sit down. Just stand up in the room. Okay, I won't embarrass you, but I think it'll give a, a good indication. And, and those that can't, that's okay. Maybe put your hand up, Daisy and others. Um, okay, age. If you're between 16 and 50, stay standing. If you're a male, stay standing. But now if you're female, stand back up again. 30% of women have been known to be cyber criminals in the information that we've been collected. In Russia, it was 51.5%. So many people think and have this stereotype in their head of a traditional cyber criminal doesn't tend to be female. Maybe that's because there's only about 18% of us in the workforce. This is not a stat I want women to be um, reaching, by the way, okay? So let's keep that one down a bit if we can, but stay standing. Okay, tertiary educated. So that would mean, you know, TAFE, if you've got micro-credentials and um, badges, I'll probably include those as well. University degree. So if you have those, keep standing. You mainly work in IT. Yeah, that, that's probably a given. Oh, we've got some sitting down. Um, you have access to technology. Do you can see this profiling? We've got quite a few people in the room here still standing. Look around. Quite a few younger ones had a parent that worked in IT. But let's just get everyone who's got a parent that works in IT to stay standing and the rest of you can sit down. Significant, right? Yeah. <laughs> Looking around, who's a potential cyber criminal? If you're single, and this is where, you know, um, you really don't have to admit this to everyone, although you know, it could be interesting later tonight. If you're single, stay standing. <laughs> okay. And if you live with your parents, stay standing. <laughs> What's your name? Daddy. Daddy, I am so sorry. <laughs> okay. What about this one? Strong attention to detail? Yeah? Okay. Don't worry, you can sit down, Danny. Oh, sorry, and there was a female up the back there too, was there? Yeah, sorry, what was your name? Okay, maybe you and Danny should talk later. <laughs> so, some other really interesting demographics here, and um, that was just a bit of fun to show you, you know, in terms of statistically in a, in a room, uh, to have a look around and say, you know, there's potentiality everywhere. Uh, they tend to have low self-control, right? So a lot of online shopping, and I'm a bit guilty of that myself, my husband would say, um, and, a, and a gaming addiction. So usually in that space of, um, you know, potentially not casinos and things, but more on what we know is the video gaming side of things as we sit here in a casino. Um, no previous criminal history. Really interestingly, most people who are convicted have no previous criminal history. This is similar to what was presented in the earlier talk, narcissistic or ASD traits. Now, I have a daughter that has ASD traits. She actually wants to, when she finishes year 12, um, be a specialist in serial killers, um, which worried me at first until I realised that they're predominantly men and um, she probably doesn't fit that profile yet. So I'll, I'll let her explore that um, profiling as a career. Perhaps her mum being in criminology helps with that a bit. But narcissistic traits, you know, quite egotistical, um, a really strong belief in themselves. And I think we all know the most typical narcissist that we could probably agree on would be Donald Trump, right? So very similar types of traits if you're not sure what narcissistic traits are. Interestingly, usually recruited when they're um, at university or unemployed. And when you think about that, you've got more time on your hands, you've got a more flexible work schedule, um, you know, it's just a thing that they are the targets. So interestingly, that continues through. So they get a job and they will continue through the cyber criminology. Okay, so they don't just stop being a cyber criminal, but that is when they're recruited primarily. More than half, we found, of the cases in the US that were cyber criminal cases were actually involving more than one offender. 
So suggesting a group-based activity, and I think we all know that. We hear about the cyber criminal groups and gangs, so um, that aligns there. And then, really interesting, I found this stat interesting, so I made them go and explore it a bit deeper, but a victim is six times as likely as the general population to turn and become a cyber criminal. So there's a lot of focus at the moment on um, studies and funding for victims, which should be the case. But I do think we need to have that lens and go, okay, if someone's been hit up multiple times, perhaps we really need to think about, you know, could they flip or turn? So from a profiling perspective, I don't think your granny is going to do that. But, um, you know, we're all getting um, hit upon in this space, so we need to be careful. And lastly, um, which ties into the previous one, was serial because they commit multiple offences. We do not usually find them just doing it once and running away. Jeez, it'd be good if they could just do it once. Can you imagine if you flip to the other side and you hit someone up for five million bucks and then you just ran away and didn't do it again? But that's not what they do and that's how they get caught. So, what are some theories behind this? Now, when I think of theory, um, you know, and talk about theory, a lot of eyes glaze over. Don't worry, I'm not going to do that to you. But um, I do think some of these ones are more interesting. Now, again, another definition. This is from the Police Journal. Uh, this one I've focused on, you know, putting in bold a, a few key elements here. The anonymity offered by the internet enables people to participate in activities such as encouraging violence against others with little or no fear of retaliation. So this concept of anonymization, moral disengagement, and I think we're all across this generally, but I wanted to go a bit deeper into that. So some of you may have seen this. This is my Pokemon avatar. So I am anonymous in Pokemon. I am not Kylie Botson in Pokemon. I am Honey Chester, and I have Eevee on my shoulder. Any Pokemon people out there, feel free to be my Pokemon friend. When I am Honey Eevee, or Honey Chester, sorry, I am out there to battle. I am out there to take prisoners, to capture Pokemon, and I have a little friend by my side who helps me significantly. Do you think I look like this? No, be honest, right? That is not me. I am not as younger. Look at the clothes she's wearing. She's got a little companion on her side. She's got cool gloves on, little shorts. So I can guarantee you I don't get around like that. So this is a persona that I present online. And I can guarantee you there's people in the room here who have a persona that's not like them in their gaming. Anyone here want to put up your hand and, and just own up to that? Yep, yep. I would have thought a few more, yeah. And anyone heard of Beyonce talking about, I'm Sasha Fierce when I'm on stage. So when I'm on stage, I can go and do all these cartwheels and I can wear these overly glittery clothes and I'm really strong and bold. But actually, apparently, she's quite introverted off stage. So that is the persona that she adopts and then she has these different behaviours. And that's actually a very valid thing in cyber um, criminal uh, behaviours and, you know, the way they present themselves online. And you imagine if one persona like that is then talking to another one, it's not a real conversation. They're both presenting personas and there's no real authentic connection. And the next one I wanted to really show you was, um, you know, this whole moral disengagement. When you go out to a petrol station, let's say, and you go to the cashier and you say, give me all your money. You know, and you're protected, you've probably got a face mask on, a hoodie, you know, you don't want the cameras to see you. You can see the fear in their eyes. You can see the physiological reaction if it's anger, right? You can see that and feel it. But when you're behind a keyboard, you don't have that. You don't see that. So you become bolder and you become braver and you perhaps indulge in behaviours that you mum wouldn't approve of, but that you would not normally do. So you are not facing the victim in the heat of the attack. It is depersonalisation. You're a step back from it. So there's no fingerprints, right? There's no way to catch you. And you don't, you, when they interview them, and there were out of the 20 convictions, there were five interviews. Most of the perpetrators had no idea what they could be charged with. 
So if you conduct a robbery, you probably know you're going to get charged with armed robbery, right? They had no idea about what they would actually be charged with. So it's almost like a, um, you know, a thinking that, well, almost like denial. Well, if I'm going to do this, I don't really know what you know, the impact's going to be. So perhaps more work needs to be done in that space to make it really clear that this is what's going to happen if you indulge in these behaviours. So anime theory is a way we look at how people are drawn to these types of behaviours. So we've got the anonymization, the depersonalization, the disengagement. So how does someone get there? And how they get there is through a number of theories. This anime theory is very much about a normal individual trying to do the right thing in society. They try to follow societal rules, they try to get a job, they try to be a student, you know, they try to do these things, and the environment around them does not support this. Anyone here watched either the UK or the US version of Shameless? Hands up, yep. Think of Lip, think of Fiona. So for those that don't watch it, you know, Lip turns to hacking for a while as well. But everything he does, you know, he starts off trying to get a line, trying to do the right thing, and he's just brought down by societal pressures around him, by the need to feed the family, by what other people are saying to him. He tries to get a mentor in the university, but he's just wired for failure because of the people around him. And his sister Fiona is quite similar, although in a, it's a fictional TV series, but she does end up being able to escape by having to leave all of that behind completely and start afresh somewhere new. A really good example of this, and this is the type of behaviour, because you know, these types of people then go, well, I'm going to indulge in something that is not um, respected, is not necessarily the norm, and is not what people would expect. Because they get so frustrated, you know, I, I keep trying to do the right thing and I'm brought down again and again and again. And it's usually multiple times. I had someone that um, worked with me that went to school with um, my husband who came and worked in my team. And um, he's a really good example, and I think real life examples are great, and I have permission without sharing his name um, to be able to share this. But he had had a, a, a very difficult childhood. He'd gone into you know, the illegal activities. You can imagine what that might be as a teenager. And um, he finally got a step up by getting a Department of Housing flat. And he was so excited and he came to me and he says, are there any jobs? Like, I've got a government flat now, um, you know, is there anything? And we found him um, entry-level job just cataloguing, right? He loved it. He turned up for work every day. He was really good. He was clean by this stage and all the Ill illegal things he'd been doing. We got him all and leaned in and got him all police checked and everything. And fantastic, a great worker. And then he came into work one day and he was really upset. And I said, what happened? And he said, I got with my second paycheck, I saved up and I bought a big TV, like a big ass TV, right? He said, and I was so excited and I, you know, everyone in the flat knew about it because I was having to lug it upstairs and, and um, invited some people around to watch the footy with me and it's fantastic. He said, but then it got stolen because everybody in the housing complex knew it was there. They couldn't afford one and they wanted one or they wanted to sell it on and they stole it. And he wasn't insured. So we're like, don't worry, it's okay. You know, you, you can still get ahead. You can buy another TV, put double locks on your doors, do whatever. So he went okay. Um, a few weeks later, and it was, oh, it was probably about a month later, he came in and he was beaten and bruised and obviously been in a fight, like swollen lip, black eyes... I said, what is going on? And he said, well, he said, I couldn't help it. There was a domestic violence altercation above me. I've got to know the female with the child really well from just going up and down the stairs and chatting at the mailbox, he said. And she was getting beaten up by a boyfriend, he said. And I could hear her screaming, so I called the police. And um, then after the police left, he came and he beat me up because he knew it was me. So we're like, oh, and then he said, it was about a few months later, and this, these types of typical things were happening, and we thought, as a team, we really wanted to help him. So we said, what can we do? And he goes, well, I don't know. So we all got together and we said, we're going to write a letter to the Department of Housing, we're going to ask for him to be re relocated, we're going to talk about all these different things, and we're going to work with them as his employer. Now, at first, they didn't want to talk to us, but we intervened. 
um, we got him moved. But he's a classic example, and he, he was able to stay on the straight and narrow and be able to get his um, you know, TV and things. But he's a classic example where the only people that stepped in for him was his boss and his colleagues in the job that he'd got. The people around him, his family couldn't support him. They were like five hours away. Um, they couldn't afford, you know, big TVs. And so it's really important when you're thinking about this that these people don't have a significant intervention that holds them and takes them all the way through on that journey and will contact, you know, Department of Housing and go, hey, this isn't okay. So, you know, it could be seen as interference, but we got him back on track and there's about 15 years later and he's doing fantastically now. I wanted to tell you that story because he tried legitimate means to get ahead and this is very typical of anime theory, is they try legitimate means to get ahead, but they're getting brought down by the pressures around them, society and influences around them. So this then leans into another theory, right? This is strain theory. You don't have to remember all these theories, but I think they're, they're pretty interesting in that... Um, what Merton um, said, who was an academic in this space in criminology, was that we have these five sort of key areas um, that show an indication of crime. And we're taking this to cybercrime as well. And the first one was, which I hope everyone in the room here is, is the conformity. We turn up to work every day, they do the right thing, you know, we get paid at the end of the day, we're a good societal member, we contribute and give back, okay? those types of people do not usually lend themselves to cybercrime or crime. The second one is ritualism. And there's going to be some of you in this room. Don't tell your boss if he's sitting with you. Um, you're not in the number three, so you can see there's a line there. Um, but you rock up to work and you don't really care and you don't really want to be there and you just go through the ritual so you can get your paycheck. Okay? You are slightly at risk when we're doing insider profiling at possibly jumping the barrier, okay? So if you're in that space, maybe go find something that really motivates you that you want to do instead. Then we get to the line, right? So this line gets crossed over into what we call innovation. So you can think about it. You've been in this ritualistic environment. You're a bit bored. You're a bit unhappy. So what you actually do is start being innovative or creative about how your life might get more interesting or how you might get ahead. And so you can see this is things like robbing a bank, okay? Um, it's very clear. We then go to retreatism, where you start to retreat from society. It hasn't been working for you. Um, you start dropping out of work, potentially doing drugs. Um, and th these are just some examples. And, and remember, we're profiling, so it's not always 100% accurate. And then rebellion, and you can see that a lot with the hacktivists and the sabotage, where people reject society's goals. I see this, and we might have some in the audience to so come and talk to me after, if you don't agree, in the sovereign citizen movement, right? They are just rebelling. I do not have to give you my license, you know, I don't have to obey societal rules, you know, they are not my rules, I am a sovereign citizen. Okay, so when you're looking at those people, uh, they are predisposed. I'm not saying everyone in these segments will commit a crime, but they're very much predisposed, uh, predisposed to be able to commit a crime. And you can see there the insider threats are across all three of those as well. So the social strain theory, I think one of the best ways to look at it is that disconnect between the dream and the material obsessions that a lot of us are pushed towards. So the great American dream, right? We hear this all the time, the big house, you know, um, the great schools, the ability to, you know, go to a job and have all these, you know, fancy handbags for the women or fancy cars for the men and everyone can do this and we're all about freedom and, you know, right. Hey, you know, you hear this whole, we can do it, everyone can do it. Do you think everyone can? No, you just have to go to America and look at the homeless situation. There's this huge disconnect, right? There's this strain. They are trying to do it, they're trying to get there, but they get up, which is the enemy, and, you know, then they get pushed back down again, okay? So there's this huge sort of pursuit of money, um, you know, and material objects that tends to be a huge catalyst, and we see this particularly in ransomware and you can probably you know, match those two together about the motivators for that. And the last theory I'm going to throw to you is rational choice theory. 
Um, so individuals, I'll read this out, engage in cybercrime because they believe it is profitable and low risk. In other words, they weigh the potential benefits of committing a crime against potential benefits of, you know, getting caught and punished. And so we spoke a little earlier about, you know, the legalities and not quite knowing what they are. Um, it is quite opportunistic as well. But they're less likely to face shame and embarrassment. They have the remoteness of the victims that they're attacking. It's really easy for them to execute. We just saw in this morning's keynote, right, how easy it can be to execute, particularly for social engineering. And they have a vast array of tools, you know, in ransomware, with ransomware as a service and a whole bunch of patterns and things that you can buy on the dark web quite easily. And they, um, they do tend to replicate their attacks quite um, easily because they just buy something and they just repeat it on different victims again and again and again. But you can see in this theory that the benefits of committing this crime you know, outweigh the risk because they can't really see what the legal implications will be. We don't really arrest that many cyber criminals and it's pretty easy to do. So, you know, if you're a, a little bit opportunistic or a little bit lazy, you know, let, let's go here. So that's another theory in that space as well. So I wanted to quickly touch on a case study to be able to map this back for you. And this is a recent one. I don't know anyone in the room across this one because this was March this year. This is the AFP put this one out. So this was a cybercrime syndicate dismantled, you know, $1.7 million was laundered. Um, there were four members of this syndicate. They were accused of money laundering, $1.7 million in stolen cash from Australian and overseas victims. They were charged in Brisbane, Adelaide and Melbourne. So you can see instantly here there's a group. So I mentioned in that profiling before, about 50% of those that had been um, convicted were part of a group. So they're part of a group. Um, they're also geographically spread, although it's within Australia. The AFP, this is from the statement, alleges the syndicate orchestrated more than 15 sophisticated cybercrime incidents, so sophisticated, so intellectually smart, between January 2020 and March 2023, so a few months ago, and set up more than 80 bank accounts with stolen identities to help transfer the money out of Australia. These are serial offenders. So January 2020 and March 2023, 80 bank accounts, they're not just doing one, right? They're serial offenders. There were two women and two men so take away that whole we just discussed before about thinking it's male only. Women do tend to be the mules more than actually involved in the um, in the, the the actual incident. But there was uh, two Brisbane women, a Melbourne man, and an Adelaide man. Again, geographically spread. AFP investigators executed five search warrants. $1.1 million was laundered to bank accounts in South Africa, where the group was working with associates, so again, group beyond them, which we haven't been able to pin down yet, it looks like, which sourced legitimate identity documents, altered the photographs and birth dates so Australian syndicate members could use them. So if you went to the keynote this morning, you can say, ah, yeah, that's actually a thing, right? This has just happened recently. The majority of documents belong to victims residing in South Africa. And when we looked before, when I mentioned the profiling of age, they were 35, 27, 26, and 30 years of age. So they fit that profile for those aspects of it. So it'd be interesting to explore further. <laughs> were they single? Did they live with their parents? You know, uh, what, what was the background there? But that's just a, a quick example of something recent that I've grabbed and we could, and I could challenge you to grab any that you see or know of and then map that back to the profiling, which we will look to get more accurate and hopefully I'll be here next year with the actual study being published in more detail. So why do this profiling? Um, it is used in traditional crime for prevention, particularly, and as I mentioned before, to be able to get convictions. The police are sick of getting people on the stand and they can't convict them, and it's really difficult to convict the cyber criminals more so than traditional crime. So we do need more effort in that, and we do need to profile more. 
Now I have five minutes to go, so I'm really, these slides will be available. I'm gonna flick over these. But I've broken down into nation state and I'll pick out a few. So who are the cyber criminals in nation state? And think about the profile I gave you before. There's a slight nuances between these, um, what we call cohorts in sociology. So you can see national pride, patriotism, intolerance of other ways of life. If any of you watched um, the recent Four Corners, you can see there was a strong intolerance of Western society in the people that were contacted that were hackers. Um, interesting, usually recruited from military police or are military or police, you know, being engaged or employed by the, the actual nation to do this on their behalf. We'll have some here, maybe in this room um, from our, our side civil servant, licensed to hack. They're really sophisticated, they hide their tracks really well. Um, they can sit in your systems for longer without you knowing and they are harder to eradicate. So they do play the long game. So if we go to the next one, uh, the actual cyber criminal groups. These are the ones that often go in, clock in, clock off, you know, in the really big troll farms that you may have heard of. That have, there was one about two years ago, they arrested, they even had a little bell when they hit their target, like a salesperson might like, ding, 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 we just got this much. Okay, so they're quite sophisticated. Interestingly, they seem to have evolved from the research I did about five or six years ago, and I want to map this a bit better, to street gangs of New York and all the issues we had in the 90s. So a lot of um, hierarchy, almost like gangs or mafia-like, right? There's certain uh, sense of belonging, uh, certain things that you have to do to still be a part of that group and recognised as that group. So uh, that's your more typical money laundering. You can see the ransomware, greed, fear, playing on that. Um, ego-led, you know, very ego-led. They will turn around and go, hey, you know, it was me and brag about their conquests. They're not as sophisticated. Some are, right, uh, but only a few. Most of them tend to be the smaller groups, um, you know, and it's the quick buck if they can do it. And they reuse, those in security operations centres know this, they reuse the patterns and the vectors from one to the other. So can you imagine if we actually shared the cyber threat intelligence more, how much we'd be able to um, get insights and be able to prevent these things from happening? Because I go into various um, SOCs and I see threats and I go, but that pattern was just used over here a few weeks ago, right? But they don't know that in there because they weren't in the other organisation a few weeks ago. Um, and then again, the hacktivist sabotage. I should probably break out the sabotage a little bit from that because the sabotage are less likely to be involved in physical protests. These ones are probably the smartest. They're, they're the ones that, you know, potentially are out there protesting, they have social, um, you know, things that they want changed, they're passionate, they're angry, um, they do tend to move in a group. They are predominantly young males, they're usually at university. Um, and they tend to have emotional regulation issues. Now, I need to explore that a little bit, so don't take me 100% on that, but that's the early findings that we're getting now. And you can have a look at this, but the types of attacks um, that they have and the, the patterns we're exploring a bit more. So wrapping up, why does it matter? Like, who cares? Why, why do we need to know this? Well, like I said before, if there was more information sharing about the vectors and the patterns and your know, typical types of things that they're using between organisations, well, that will help. But I'm more about the understanding the profiling because we all know in policing, in detective units, you know, in profiling units, behavioural analysis, that we can get in there a little bit earlier, we can intervene um, in various elements. It's very hard to map what you prevented. We all know that, right? How many people in cyber go to the board and go, well, we did all these great things, so therefore we weren't attacked, but how do you actually put dollars on that, right? It's really hard to measure, well, this didn't happen. It's easier to measure, you know, this is what happened. So we want to be able to um, get better at doing that. Um, most cyber crimes are serial in nature, so I think if we can find out what those patterns are, that will help us um, a little better in this and the signature and modus operandi, like the talk before me, which was about serial killers and how we get better at identifying them and cracking down on them, um, is very similar. We want to be able to get in there and get the insights into that. So I just want to go back to, um, you know, what we talked about before about, you know, could you profile the hacker from high school? And I did the little exercise in the room. Um, please don't take offence um, to my two upstanding people. But um, think about the people around you, you know, and think about that profile 
and um, think about social engineering attacks and things as well and just um, just know a little bit more and look a little bit more at that side of it because we get embedded particularly in the SOX, particularly in the policy and the compliance in the technology. You know, my job as a cyber sociologist is to look at the people and the process and the, what Gartner's come out with lately is the human-centred security design and I think if we know more about that then we're going to be able to um, have better defensive mechanisms. We're going to go know a little bit more. Maybe we can take Australia off being in the top, um, what, what are we, the top five of attacks or something? I was looking at the, the boards yesterday. Interesting, I found Iceland in the top 100. I had a conversation with someone about that and they gave me insight. I'm happy to unpack that a little bit later with someone. Um, but yeah, Brian was right. We need more research into this. We need to know more about it. And it's interesting, right? So if anyone wants to have a chat to me later about any of the research, you want to get involved in the research, um, you are. Sometimes I've given these talks and in different areas and I've had a criminologist in the room come and say hi because you know I absolutely want to do more with you. But thank you everyone. Um, you can reach me on LinkedIn. There's my little QR code if you want to reach out and um, yeah, contact me with any, anything else. I think we're near time. Thank you very much, Kylie. Can we have a round of applause for Kylie Watson?